take our foot off the gas with a look at two new driving games for the PlayStation 2. And we shake our thing with Gasso and a whole new cast of disco queens in Busted Groove 2, the follow-up to last year's dance title. And we go where no one has gone before in our review of Star Trek Armada. Stick around, it's game time. Welcome to GameSpot TV. I'm Adam Sessler, and we're here on the coast of San Francisco, California at Seal Rock to check out the Musée Mécanique, which has a collection of games from the turn of the century, so they're not based on the ones and zeros like the Adam. games we know. Hey, come on, you're missing all the cool stuff. Hurry up. Well, I'm going to go win myself some bubblegum, but first let's look at some games that are a little bit more contemporary and involve the free environment seen in games like Shenmue. But these aren't action-adventure games, they're driving games, and they're both for the PlayStation 2. It's Smuggler's Run and Midnight Club. Both games are, are similar in one respect in that they feature wide open environments. So uh, Angel Studios specializes in uh, kind of real time physics and these huge expansive worlds. So Smuggler's Run is a game where uh, it's all based on uh, smuggling and the art of collecting and delivering contraband. The point of it is really uh, driving hell bent for leather across wide open environments uh, against numerous other opponents and against uh, law enforcement. Uh, to collect contraband, deliver it to a certain place. These environments are huge. I mean, literally a five mile square. Um, and so you can drive for five or six minutes wide open across an entire plane. There are no uh, cull rooms, no limitations. Midnight Club is uh, all about illegal street racing in the largest cities in the world. So New York, London, and Tokyo are featuring in this version of the game. And it's a wide open map of the city. So it's not a track that looks like Manhattan. It's, it's actually all of Manhattan. Uh, with about 90 kilometers of roads uh, length. And so we have all the neighborhoods, or a number of neighborhoods. We've made kind of a caricature of each city so that all the major landmarks are there that you would recognize. The cities have full traffic. Uh, you know, you can make huge pileups. There are parked cars. It's mayhem. Both games feature Angel Studios' physics engine, which we've been developing for a number of years. Um, and uh, the, the PlayStation really takes advantage of it because these open environments really show uh, the vehicles interacting with the environment uh, very, very accurately. You start seeing very subtle motions of the suspension, uh, very subtle interactions with the, with the uh, rocks in the environment or the buildings in the environment. And so we do temper it a little bit, and that pure physics isn't that much fun because you just you have no control. So we kind of uh, We'll balance it out a little bit with recovery from an accident fairly quickly. We'll kind of keep the car up a little bit. You can still turn over on your roof and you can still go on your side. Two-wheel driving is a big feature, uh, but it's fairly simple to control. It's a very accessible driving model. We're very impressed with the PlayStation 2's capabilities. Uh, we've been waiting so many years for a console to actually have some, some, some horsepower, some guts to it. Both these games could not happen on any other platform right now. Um, there's this procedural terrain, uh, huge traffic jams. Uh, it just wouldn't be possible with any other device. You know, Rockstar Games is releasing both of these titles, and they hope to have them ready for the PlayStation 2 launch in the fall. Man, check out what racing games used to be like. Yes, it's, it's so immersive. Yeah, well, you know what? We'll do this. Y'all watch the news. Go, go, go. Sony filed another suit against Bleem, which states that the emulator is infringing on six of Sony's patents. This comes after Bleem's announcement that it has created software that will enable Dreamcast owners to run PlayStation games on the console. Previously, Sony attempted and failed to sue Bleem over the software that allowed PlayStation games to be played on a PC. Shoichiro Iramajiri of Sega will resign from his position as president. However, he will stay with Sega as vice chairman where he will contribute to the design and development of the successor to the Dreamcast console. A representative of the company said that the main reason for Iramajiri's resignation is due to the lackluster sales of the Dreamcast. Lionhead officials revealed the release date of Black and White, Peter Molyneux's nearly complete God game. According to one of the designers, black and white for the PC will hit store shelves on September 23rd, 2000. While EA has not confirmed or announced this date, Lionhead feels confident that the game will be ready in time to make its scheduled launch. For more gaming news, go to the GameSpot TV website. And for more info on Rockstar's upcoming titles, go to the website too. 
Yes, and there you can find an interview with the game's creator, Michael Limbar. And if you want more information on where we are today, check out the site for the Musée Mécanique. Yes, get nostalgic for a time before you were born. Way before. Coming up on GameSpot TV, we combat terrorists in our review of Rogue Spear's add-on pack, Urban Operations. Welcome back. As you can see, the unbelievable mechanical farm is only one of the very impressive displays they have here at the Musée Mechanique. And in fact, it's pretty much space age for its time. Of course, for our time, we have titles like Free Space 2, Star Lancer, and if you haven't had enough space sims, here's Tachyon. Tachyon the Fringe is a fast-paced, action-packed space combat game with an amusing story. It's a space sim that drops you in more than a few deep space dogfights with style. One of the game's selling points is Tachyon's main character, Jake Logan. Whoa, that's a big gun. Now, it's not the fact that Jake is charming, which he is, but the fact that he's been voiced by none other than Bruce Campbell, the star of the Evil Dead series. And Campy Campbell adds his own brand of cheeky wit to Jake's personality. Oh, and uh, I'm fine, too. Thanks for caring. The game's story is based on a freedom fighters versus corporate swine premise, and the campaigns, though not very detailed, are lots of fun. The graphics in Tachyon go from great to standard. The cockpit reflections and ship explosions are eye-catching, and the nebulae and space stations make you want to join up with NASA. Weapons effects? Unpolished heads-up displays and unconvincing motion-blurred streaks, however, are rather disappointing. The sound department boasts a techno-symphonic soundtrack that changes with the game. As the tension mounts, the music goes with it. The controls are responsive, and there's a great mid-flight feature that allows you to zigzag through battlefields. Tachyon also has a multiplayer and online component. Though the game doesn't break new ground as a space sim, you'll still have a good time playing it. GameSpot.com gives Tacky on the Fringe a 7.5 out of 10. Oh, another one bites the dust. All right, now let's come on back down to Earth for a minute, where the now classic Rainbow Six Rogue Spear has an add-on. Check this out. Careful, it goes inside. Saying Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six Rogue Spear Mission Pack Urban Operations can be a mouthful. And while you might think that the title has more substance than the game itself, Urban Ops does hold its own, even though it is only an expansion pack. Mission success. Objective completed. Bluntly speaking, here's what you get. Four new weapons, two new mini campaigns with five maps each, and eight new multiplayer maps. Now, the word mini should be taken literally in regards to the campaign. These are plotless, unrelated missions based in well-made environments. Five of the maps are from the original Rainbow Six, and it is intriguing to see them run on the Rogue Spear engine. Mission failure. A hostage was killed. What makes Urban Ops a worthwhile purchase is the custom missions option. You're allowed to replay on any map with different mission goals, opposing up to 50 terrorists. This option adds significant single-player replay value, setting up about 60 distinct missions spread amongst the game's 18 maps. These maps add more life to the online experience as well. The multiplayer-only maps might be small, but they're still fun to play. Tangos have body armor. Place your shots carefully. Urban Operations makes no attempt to depart from Rogue Spear, but it is substantial in both single and multiplayer modes, making its suggested price of $20 very reasonable. GameSpot.com gives Rainbow Six Rogue Spear Mission Pack Urban Operations a 7.2 out of 10. This looks like it's a different sort of urban operation. Anyhow, for those of you who are Star Trek fans, you've probably been quite disappointed with many of the games that have been tied in with the series. But take heart, this next game, Star Trek Armada, is something different. Bajor, Kronos, Earth, they're all assimilated planets. Most Star Trek games aren't exactly stellar. Star Trek Armada, however, manages to come through as an impressive real-time strategy game. Armada lets you do battle with fleets of four of Star Trek's most popular races. I will see to it that day never comes. It isn't an especially complex game, but it's fun thanks to good visuals and decent gameplay. Report. 
Star Trek Armada's design scheme is exceptional. The game's 3D graphics engine gives it crisp details and bright colors. The spacecraft look and move almost exactly as they do in the next-gen episodes and movies, which is key if you're a detail stickler. Combat details are well done, even up to the sound effects. Phasers and photon torpedoes sizzle against enemy shields. Armada's outer space is filled with swirling nebula and dense asteroid belts. Now, the nebula disable or impair any ships within and may create tactical opportunities for ambush or retreat. Armada's a fairly simple game at the strategic level. Each race has about five different vessels suited to combat, and each race's vessels have an analogous counterpart on the three other sides. Unfortunately, Armada's technical problems can get in the way and can suddenly lock up on you in the middle of a mission. Today is a good day to die. Star Trek Armada is essentially no different from other real-time strategy games, aside from its appeal to Trekkers. Captain, we are receiving a transmission from the Borg cube. On screen. Now, if you can deal with the bugs, Armada's a lot of fun. It's also one of the few Star Trek games to do the series justice. GameSpot gives Star Trek Armada 7.9 out of 10. Kaplach! Resistance is and always has been futile. By the way, in case you're wondering, that really was me playing Armada and dying lots, so Adam had to put up with a lot of stupid, stupid Klingon type exclamations coming from me. Now, if you want to put a good exclamation point on your tech romancer battles, then check out this tip. Capcom's Techromancer is an over-the-top giant robot anime fighter that can be quite demanding unless you know how to be resourceful. Extreme Impact! The final attack needs some careful attention because its slow startup time can make the attack blockable. To ensure that you connect, always use your final attack as a follow-up to your steel dash. With good timing, your opponent's attack will be countered and you can end the match swiftly and surely. Sal found the hidden humor in our tips and tricks. Yeah, apparently, but if you missed any of it, just check out our website at ddtv.com slash GameSpot TV, where we'll have everything we just talked about in beautiful streaming video. And make sure you stay tuned, because we'll be announcing the lucky winners of the Shenmue Haiku giveaway. But if you can't stand the suspense, just check out the website now for the names of our three lucky winners. What is so funny? The whole thing's disturbing. Coming up on GameSpot TV, take your drama mean, we have a preview of Power Stone 2. And we hit the dance floor in our preview of Busted Groove 2. Welcome back to the Museum Mechanique in San Francisco. Which one did you use? Fly, dude. Well, it looks like Sega's Dreamcast has been out long, long enough that there are actually sequels coming out for games that launched with the system. Yes, uh, Power Stone was a good if, if overlooked fighting title, but the sequel is going to do a lot more to get your attention. How's the arm? It hurts. Pride? Hurts. If you're worrying that Capcom will resort to giving you more of the same in Power Stone 2, then a pleasant surprise may be on its way. The game has new environments, new characters, far more interactivity, and it supports four players. Someone correctly realized that the simple controls provide the perfect basis for a multiplayer free-for-all. And with more fists flying, this means that getting three Power Stones will be a whole lot trickier. In addition to duking it out for yourself, you can also take sides and fight it out in teams. While that should be enough, the real excitement is in the levels themselves and how interactive they are. New additions such as tanks you can drive around and blast players with to swimming from submerging ships add to an already frenetic concept. Topping all this is a level which requires you to battle your opponents as you race from an Indiana Jones-style boulder. Most reassuring, though, is that the game still retains the pick-up-and-play appeal of the original, so getting three other buddies to duke it out in cartoonish mayhem should prove pretty easy. So is it worth straining friendships? Well, we'll let you know when it's released later this year. That game's got a lot going on. I'll tell you what, why don't we see what Grandmother says is coming up on the show, huh? Mmm, no one lives forever. According to the 007 Guide to Existence, you only live twice. According to the espionage game due out by Fox Interactive, no one lives forever. 
Though less optimistic with its title than the movie, the game also revolves around a very stylish 60s spy. But this time, the agent is a woman. Combine Austin Powers' camp with a first-person shooter wearing knee-high white boots, and you've entered the world of Agent Archer, a smart and savvy female operative on a secret mission of great importance. Not only will Agent Archer have conventional weapons and tools at her disposal, but she'll also be armed with a number of experimental gadgets and weapons that she'll either begin the game with or pick up along the way. Archer, Agent Archer, will travel to exotic locations all around the globe in search of key characters and hidden items critical to her mission. And, true to the Bond-esque formula, enemy operatives have laid a number of cunning traps in key locations. It'll be up to the player to use their brains and space-age gadgets to defuse the nasty surprises that await. Prospective super spies will be able to explore a seedy world of assassins, intrigue, and tall hairdos at the end of this year hey, when Brian. No One Lives Forever is scheduled Brian. for release. Bring me a soda. You know, I remember the booth for this game at E3 featuring a very bored-looking go-go dancer in a cage. Well, she should have been playing Buster Group too, because that's a dancing game that never gets boring, even, even in, in a cage. cage. Continuing the burgeoning dance game craze, we have Busted Groove 2. Though not as innovative as the original, Part 2 makes a valiant attempt to keep up with previous standards. Much has been carried over from its predecessor, with appropriate refinements. Special attacks and evades look better, and the dance view mode has been kept so you can learn the moves yourself. Everybody get loose and jam! Some characters from the first game are absent, though the replacements are more than decent. These include Bio, Gasso's zombie dad, and Pander, a Kabuki-style dancer. Fans of the first game should note that the series has changed music labels from Avex tracks to East-West Japan. So you might notice differences in style, yet it's still predominantly the same J-pop we've all grown to love. The new characters are the game's main draw, if you can stand the cheese. The first game was innovative enough that much wasn't changed and should be something to look forward to this summer. I so had my groove on playing that game. Yes, but it is a little hectic until you get those buttons down cold. Yeah, no kidding. Not as hectic as Power Stone 2, though. But little is. But if mayhem is what you love, then come to the GameSpot TV website for more. Coming up on GameSpot TV, we flash to the past in a look at some old favorites now available for your PC. Welcome back to the Musée Mécanique in San Francisco. And you know, we can hardly look at all these beautiful old games without paying some sort of homage to games of yore. Yes, yeah, so what comes to mind more when one thinks of classic games than Atari? Hopscotch? Hi, gal. Back when Journey kept the wheels in the sky a-turnin', a company named Atari kept the quarters in my pocket a-movin' with what are now some of the most classic arcade games possible. The box set Atari Arcade Classics for the PC brings back my memories of pre-adolescent happiness with 12 titles like Centipede, Pong, Battlezone, and my personal favorite, Crystal Castles. Go, Bentley Bear, collect gems. But many a gamer will tell you that these games are available with dubious legality on the web. But this box set has a few other goodies that would definitely appeal to the nostalgic gamer. Firstly, you can customize the game for various lives and difficulty levels. Also, the discs provide for enhanced graphics. No, they're not going 3D, but there's definitely a difference. Okay, it's gimmicky, but it's a fun gimmick. Also, the discs contain the archives, with many a photo of old promotional materials for arcade games, photos of 2,600 cartridges, and our friend, the trackball. Also available are excerpts from the book Phoenix, The Fall and Rise of Video Games. It's a fun little package that should appeal to anyone that spent too many hours in dank arcades and pizza parlors. And it also goes to show how much of a cultural force gaming has been and continues to be. But most importantly, it allows you to take Bentley Bear home. Another nice thing with the Atari Arcade Classics is it's much easier to play Missile Command with a mouse. And with history on the mind, many gamers are fans of Sid Meier's Civilization or its sequel, Civilization II, Call to Power. Another game is in the works, so here's something to help you look forwards or back.
about timeless civilization, huh? Now, outside the U.S., soccer, or football, as everyone else in the world calls it, is hands down the most popular sports game for consoles. So let's take a look at our cheats for Virtuous Striker for the Dreamcast, and hopefully they'll help you out with your hooliganism. Shoot! In Virtuous Striker for the Dreamcast, you have access to 32 highly skilled teams. Actually, make that 33 highly skilled teams. Go to Team Select in the Arcade Mode and do the following. Select Yugoslavia, hit Start. Select USA, hit Start. Select Korea, hit Start. Select Italy, hit Start. <laughs> team Yuki-chan will appear, giving you a team of snowmen and polar bear forwards, mariachi defenders, and a turtle for a goalie. Now, if that isn't going global, I don't know what is. Well, there you have it. That's our show for this week. And we'd like to thank the Musée Mechanique here in San Francisco, California, underneath the Cliff House, right off of the Great Highway. And now, the moment you have all been waiting for, we will announce the names of our three winners of the Shenmue Haiku Prize Pack giveaway. Yes, it's Gary of Wyandotte, Michigan. Kip in Georgetown, Kentucky. And Brian of Bristol, Tennessee. Congratulations, Haiku Masters. Your Shenmue Prize Packs are on their way. And if you would like to see the winning haikus, come to the GameSpot TV website. So until next week, Game, Game over! over.